Chris mentioned the title of a paper that I wrote with Eben Goodstein called the Solar Dominance Hypothesis. We wrote this in large part because Eben didn't quite believe what I was going around saying, quoting Tony Seba. How many of you here have seen Tony or seen the video that, uh, Martin, you shot that video, didn't you? Uh, if you haven't, the, um, if you Google Seba Cress, it'll pop up. There's also a video from a year later at World Affairs Council, SEBA, S-E-B-A, World Affairs, it'll pop up. And basically, uh, Tony says by 2030, the world will be 100% renewably powered. And I've been saying this to Eben. Eben uh, created and runs the BARD MBA in Sustainable Management, at which I teach. And Eben said, I don't believe that. So hands up, how many of you believe that? By 2030, we're going to be 100% renewably powered. Wow, this is a... Educated room. <laughs> now, what I could get even to agree to was that we would be half renewable by 2030. How many of you believe that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot more plausible, isn't it? Well, even was still debating it. So he walked through the math. And here's what has been happening, that uh, since 2000 up to 2014, Global solar capacity has been doubling every couple of years. Each doubling cuts the cost of panels per megawatt by about 20%. So that utility scale solar is now at grid parity essentially everywhere in the world, and distributed solar is rapidly heading for grid parity, and we're having similar cost reductions in batteries. If the solar dominance hypothesis is going to be correct. This is going to have to continue to happen. So costs for solar panels continue to fall about 20% every couple of years with every doubling, and that storage does the same thing. Now, I was reasonably confident in arguing for this because of the work of Dr. Mark Jacobson at Stanford, the Solutions Project, Mark has shown for the United States, and he came actually showed for the world in an article in uh, Scientific American in 2009, that it was technically possible to power the world with 100% renewable power by 2030. He's now done this for every state in the US and many countries around the world. So if you want to crawl into the numbers the Solutions Project, or Dr. Mark Jacobson, and he's a great one to follow on Twitter because he tracks all of what's happening in this field. And basically, he said there's no technological or economic barriers to doing this. It's a question of social and political will. And that's been the conventional wisdom, that it's a question of political will until Tony popped up in 2014 and said, no, it's not, it's economics. This is going to happen for fundamental economic reasons and you can't stop it. And after the 2016 election, I went and saw Tony, I've known him for about a decade, and said, well, now you're not so sure. And he said, now I'm certain. Why? Four things, four drivers that Tony sees. Fall in the cost of solar, fall in the cost of storage, the electric car and the driverless car in 10 years' time. Really? If you look at the speed with which new technologies have been being adopted, and you can go back to the telephone over here in the corner. It dipped and took a while to get up to about... 100% adoption. And then you get over in the, uh, in the far corner where you're looking at smartphones and fridges and microwaves and tablets and such. It's almost instantaneous. Now, remember 2007. This was just before the financial collapse. That was the year the smartphone hit the market. What percentage would you have guessed 
would own a smartphone within a decade, conventional thinking would never get you to the actual answer, which was 2.5 billion smartphones, a third of the world's population owns a smartphone. What, within a decade, how many of you still use a flip phone? <laughs> yeah, there are a few, and actually they're coming back, <laughs> but they'll be smart flip phones. <laughs> yeah, right. What, what does this have to do with solar? This is a great graph by a guy named Aka Hoekstra, who, you know, if you read the conventional projections, McKinsey, uh, Wood McKinsey, uh, the International Energy Agency, our Energy Information Administration, they will tell you, yeah, we could perhaps conceivably, maybe, if you really worked at it, be renewable by 2050. And these are, Aka took year by year by year the projections of increase in growth in solar, and they were all flat, except every year they bump it up, such that the actual number is, again, not a hockey stick, it's a pogo stick. It just goes straight up. And here's his most recent. IEA projected a decrease. Now we're having an increase. We saw this here in Colorado. A couple years ago, Excel put out a bid uh, who can give us 1,100 megawatts, any price, any source, y'all bid? They knew that natural gas would be the cheapest. And gas came in at around 4 cents a kilowatt hour. Wind came in a bit below 2 cents, solar a bit above 2 cents, wind plus solar plus storage, 3 cents a kilowatt hour. Excel said no. Uh, solar tariffs, bid it again. So everybody did, 58,000 megawatts bid. Same answer. Yeah, tariffs had been slapped on and prices had continued to fall. And they, indeed, they do continue to fall. Excel said, oh, can we uh, close two coal plants and pledge to go two thirds renewable? The PUC said, yeah. Excel has then come back and said, um, okay, we'll go 100% renewable. Thank you, Leslie Glostrom. <laughs> Leslie has been fighting this battle valiantly. And this, this, this one's Leslie's. So here are this year's numbers. In June, General Electric walked away from a perfectly good natural gas plant out in California, two years' life left on it, because they said it can't compete with solar. Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has just actually finally inked the contract, but they announced the contract in June of, I believe it was 400 megawatts solar plus storage, 2.9 cents. What are you paying for electricity? Yeah, 11, 12. What's New York pay, 28? July, GE and BlackRock announced a deal, a partnership to do distributed solar plus storage. And then in August, Portugal won what I'm calling the Walmart Award for Everyday Low Price, utility scale solar, 800 megawatts at 1.6 cents a kilowatt hour. People looked at that and said, how? That's got to be below their cost. And they ran through the numbers. 20-year power purchase agreement and then a merchant power plant. Portugal, by the way, is now 100% renewably powered. And then in August, China announced it is now cheaper in China to do distributed solar, rooftop solar, than it is to hook to the Chinese coal-fired grid. This is just this last summer. Investment in renewables continues to rise, 55.5 billion in 2019, despite our Cheeto in chief. <laughs> he digs coal. Peabody is again about to go bankrupt. Glencore did go bankrupt. Here are the companies that have pledged to go 100% renewably powered. 
It's getting to be a who's who of the corporate world. Here are the companies that already are 100% renewably powered. And the list of companies that have the uh, top part, the top nine, and it doesn't include Unilever, which is now on that, which makes it 10 that are 100% renewably powered, and then on down the line. There are now several hundred companies pledging to go 100% renewable. And we aren't the big dog in this hunt. China is. China, these are floating photovoltaics, photovoltaics. In the first three months of 2018, China installed 10 nuclear plants worth of solar. India recently announced they are canceling 14 planned big coal plants because they can't compete with solar. The recent bid, 1.6 gigawatts, 900 megawatts with pumped storage at four cents a kilowatt hour, 300 megawatts with battery storage at four cents a kilowatt hour. Africa. The World Bank has been funding most of the big projects, but they're getting big projects now in Ethiopia, Madagascar, Zambia, Senegal, 4.8 cents a kilowatt hour. And again, these are multi-megawatt plants. South Africa is the, the big dog there. 1,300 megawatts of installed solar capacity and growing rapidly. The real problem in Africa is the need for distributed solar. Much of Africa has no electricity. And so just as people in the developing world leapfrogged from no phones to mobile phones, they are leapfrogging to distributed energy. Elephant Energy, which is a uh, program put together by Doug Vilsack from here in Boulder, is creating women's co-ops selling solar-powered lights, the little firefly, the D-light. Super efficient cook stoves. This is going to make an enormous difference in eradicating poverty. The UK last summer generated more energy from renewables than from coal. The UK was where the Industrial Revolution was created using coal. Scotland, by the time the Conference of Parties rolls around in Glasgow, uh, late November, early December, Scotland will be 100% renewably powered. Beginning to believe, Tony? So that's one. Batteries. The US military discovered that it is much better in forward operating bases to use solar plus batteries. This is uh, batteries put out by a little company called Simplify that I sit on the board of. Lithium ion ferrous phosphate. You know, when, uh, they, when you fly, they say don't check your lithium ion batteries. That's lithium ion cobalt chemistry. Lithium ion cobalt gets hot, is prone to thermal runaway. Cobalt is a toxic material, conflict material. Lithium ion ferrous phosphate doesn't get hot. If somebody's gonna shoot at you with a heat-seeking missile, you don't want a diesel generator, it's hot, and you don't want a cobalt battery, it's hot. So the military loves these things. The whole of the battery world is on fire just the way solar is. China, again, 20 gigafactories coming online in 2021. NREL's numbers, already in this country, 5 million US businesses would profit from putting in batteries for the couple hours a day when they're looking at peak load, peak pricing. Tucson, peak. 50 cents a kilowatt hour, off peak, five cent, do the math. It's already cost effective to put the batteries in. If you have the batteries, why not stick solar on your roof and become your own little microgrid? Or storage as a service. There are now companies offering this for people in areas with peak load. They put the batteries in and you simply contract for it. Batteries, I think Tony's right there. Cars, 
Did y'all see the announcement a couple weeks ago? Elon beat the short sellers. Boy, howdy. Tesla is now has a higher market cap than GM and Ford combined, despite selling 300 times fewer cars. What business is Tesla in? Batteries. Batteries. Bingo, it's a battery company. This is their gigafactory, solar powered. When the Aliso Canyon well blew out in Southern California and Southern California Edison, this was a gas well, Southern California Edison was uh, fearing blackouts, brownouts, Elon said, we'll just put in a big battery in record time and at record low price. He then turned around and said, let's do it in South Australia, where they were having coal power plant failures. And people said, the batteries cannot respond. If, there's a, if a plant drops out, they can't come on fast enough. Yeah, they can. They did. Elon said, I'll put it in in 100 days and you don't owe me anything. He did. Then turned around and said to the people of South Australia, now Victoria, and after the fires, much of Australia, let's do combined battery and rooftop solar. Puerto Rico, when the, uh, <laughs> when the winds were still blowing, Elon was shipping panels and batteries. Now, if Tony is right about batteries, Here's where it starts getting interesting. Bloomberg a couple of years ago that if batteries come on as fast as some people are predicting, it could trigger a $3.4 trillion credit crunch. Mm. Cars, the electric car. China has said we're going to phase out the internal combustion engine, as have a number of other countries. Norway, France, the UK, India, China, California. Fifth largest. California is the fifth largest economy. AEVs, autonomous electric vehicles. These puppies are on the road today. And yeah, they have killed a couple people. 6,000 pedestrians are killed every year by drivered cars. Cars are dangerous. And again, it's a who's who of companies working on autonomous vehicles. Apple has said they're going to use these things to move their people around. Now think about it for a minute. What do we use oil for? We don't use it in power plants much anymore. Transport. Every cent drop in the price of oil is a billion dollars in purchasing power gained by American households. If Tony is right, we're going to displace oil for transport very quickly. So why are we spending $5.2 trillion a year subsidizing fossil energy? We're stupid. <laughs> you can't fix stupid. <clears throat> but you don't have to pay for it. So the Fitch report came out and said, if Elon is right, if Elon hits his target of a $35,000, 200-mile range car, the oil industry is toast and the auto industry is toast. We are looking at the mother of all economic dislocations coming at us within 10 years' time, and we really haven't a clue how to deal with this. So... Um, October of 2018, Carbon Tracker came out with a little report called 2020 Vision. I highly recommend it. They said peak fossil 2023 and the about to be stranded fossil assets 25 trillion. This is the work of Mark Campanelli. This report was actually written by Kingsmill Bond, but Mark came up with this notion of uh, stranded assets. He said, if we are not going to roast as a planet, we have to leave 80% of the fossil in the ground. On the strength of that, John Fullerton, who was 18 years at J.P. Morgan, said, what's that worth? And on whose balance sheets sit those assets? 
and he calculated that the about to be stranded assets were between 25 and 30 trillion. On the strength of that number, Mark went back, assigned King's Mill to do this report, and they put the number at 25 trillion. And I was talking with Mark this fall, and he said, actually, Goldman has done a calculation. If you count the lost financial value from all of those assets, it's more like 100 trillion. Like, okay, those are big numbers. We're looking at big numbers anyway. These gentlemen, uh, two of them now running for president. Uh, I guess Hank Polson hasn't declared yet. <laughs> came out with a report called Risky Business a few years back, calculating the cost to the economy today of climate, of the climate impacts. And it's, it's large. These are the rise of billion dollar storms year on year on year. We keep getting more of them. Climate has already cost you and me and the taxpayers $350 billion over the last decade. By 2050 projections, that'll be $35 billion every year. At the same time, our incomes are projected to shrink because of the impact of climate change. And the impact of climate change will be particularly severe on food. I don't know about you, but I'm a little sentimental about eating. <laughs> the administration's own calculation last year that global warming costs could exceed 100 billion every year by the end of the century. And they pointed out these losses will not be equitably borne. The poor will be hurt first, worst. We will all be hurt. There is no running away from climate change. Global warming means it's global. Who's at fault? It's very easy to flight shame. You're taking a vacation on an airplane? Shame on you. Let's don't go there. Rick Heedy calculated that nearly 70% of all of the greenhouse gases that have been emitted are attributable to 100 entities. Yes, the choices that you and I make every day add up, but that's not what's driving climate change. There are 100 entities that we need to target. Christiana Figueres, the uh, wonderful woman who brought the Paris climate summit to a deal, said where capital goes over the next 15 years is going to decide whether we're actually able to address climate change and what kind of a century we're going to have. Happily, we are looking now at a tectonic shift in investing. I credit it to one young woman. When Greta led the march in New York, and then again the march here in Denver and the marches all over the country, we witnessed a tectonic shift. So Goldman came out in December. They want the bank to play a role in combating climate change. Urgent need to act, powerful business and investing case to do so. And then the Bank for International Settlements came out with an interesting report called Green Swan. You've heard the phrase black swan, the unexpected low probability, high impact event that changes everything. They said green swan risks, potentially extremely financially disruptive events that could drive the next financial crisis driven by climate change. So then BlackRock, which is the big dog in the investing world, climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects and credited the people in the streets demanding action. The fact is worth reading. This is BlackRock, Larry Fink's letter. When he, put this, he puts this letter out every year, 
Last year, there was no mention of climate change. And of course, BlackRock's own commitment is not exactly impressive. They're going to exit certain investments that present high sustainability-related risks, like coal. Yeah, come on, coal's dead. Pull your money out. They are still, however, heavily invested in gas. They still hold big stakes in Exxon, Chevron. 6% in Glencore? Ouch. That one went broke. And they have one of the worst voting records on climate issues. So it's interesting that all of these companies are making these pronouncements. Does that make them the leaders of the climate movement? No. We still need to hold their feet to the fire. But it is interesting that one after another after another, the big banks are making these kinds of pronouncements. Here's the one that really interested me. Microsoft also this January, carbon negative by 2030. They said, we are going to put a billion dollars into figuring out particularly nature-based solutions and regenerative agriculture using natural capital to soak excess carbon out of the air and put it in the soil where it belongs. The hell are they talking about? <laughs> They're talking about farmers like Gabe Brown in the Dakotas, who has been year on year on year growing his soil organic matter, carbon in the soil, roughly 1% soil organic matter is 2 tons of carbon. At a ton of carbon per acre per year increase, on all the world's grasslands, over 30 years' time, we get back to 280 parts per million concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's the pre-industrial level. That's the level in which humankind evolved. That's the safe level. So when you hear the scientists talking about, uh, well, 2 degrees C is the safe No, it's not. 2 degrees C additional warming over where we are today, or where we were. <laughs> pre-industrially. No, that's not safe. That's giving us the, uh, and we're not even at 2 degrees C, we're at a little over 1 degree C now. That's what's giving us the devastation we see today. 2 degrees C is a recipe for disaster. And we know how to get back to 280 parts per million. Zero degree C warming. We probably will go up to 2 degrees C and have to come back down. And that means it's going to get rough. It's not going to be fun. What gives me hope, though, are companies like DNVGL. This is an uh, old risk assessment company. They used to assure shipping. Uh, a Norwegian company, the equivalent of Lloyd's of London in, in Norway committed to become a regenerative company, creating a new narrative of the economy and the purpose of the economy and the corporation, a new purpose for humanity, speaking to hearts as well as minds, inspiring action and bring hope by communicating positive stories of change. And there's a business case. The companies that are leading in doing this have an 18% higher return on investment than the laggards, 67% higher than companies that say, hey, we don't care about carbon. This is the work of Carbon Disclosure Project. So where's your money? A few years back, Beavis Longstreth, who had been a SEC commissioner, said, it's entirely plausible, even predictable, that continuing to hold equities in fossil fuel companies will be ruled negligence. This is in part why BlackRock's saying what it's saying. And here's why. The dark blue line on top on this side is Exxon. The light blue line is the S&P. For years, Exxon led until it didn't. Exxon's market value is the same 
as it was in 2007. Is this a good investment? They, yeah, they pay dividends, which they are now borrowing to pay. I didn't think that was legal. So this week, actually, what day is this? Yeah, I think it was this week. Goldman issued a sell alert. Sell Exxon. Here's Exxon versus Apple. Now, this is important for a number of reasons. For, since the late 80s, the top 10 companies in the S&P, seven of them were oil and gas companies. Last year, only one, Exxon. This year, it fell out of the top 10, and now Goldman is saying to sell it. For years, from the 70s to the early 90s, Exxon drove the Standard & Poor's. The, the success of the Standard & Poor's was because of the success of Exxon. Since 2014, Exxon has lagged. And most pension funds, mutual funds, hold Exxon. What's in your portfolio? So a group of us got together a couple years back and said, why don't we create a fund that has no fossil in it. Zip, zero, none. So we did. Change Finance, changefinance.com. Check it out. It's an exchange traded fund. It trades every day on the New York Stock Exchange. And it's where I've got my money. We are in a climate emergency. The young people know this. They're telling us this. You can see it in the news. Last year, Pacific Gas and Electric Utility, the biggest utility on the North American continent, declared bankruptcy. Wall Street Journal said this is the first climate change bankruptcy, probably not the last. Australia this summer, 46 million acres burned. 32.4 thousand square miles, 46% bigger than the fires in the Amazon. The California fires were 405 square miles. And if you look on the map to the north, a lot of Southeast Asia is burning. We're happily, finally, getting snow. It's their summer. The fires hurt not only houses, people. It actually drove people into the sea. They were evacuated by the Royal Navy. We no longer have time to dither about this. The IPCC report said we have, from October a year ago, we have 11 years to deal with climate change. The Guardian said, no, that, make that 18 months, because what matters is the US presidential election. Make that, what, eight months now? Please vote. Any functional adult will do. <laughs> it's getting really dire. The scientists say by 2040, the Middle East may be too hot to be inhabitable. Where are they going to go? We are seeing monster storms. This is Maria hitting Dominica, Puerto Rico. This is Dominica after it hit. All the power lines down, phone lines down. Everything is down. So who helped? A little company called Sesame Solar, a little company called Simplify. This is a container. You flip the side out and it's solar panels. You load the container with batteries and you have a power station. This was done in Sonoma County called Stone Edge Farms. In the fires in Sonoma, this was the only place that had communications. All the emergency services went there. We are going to see a world in which we reinvent our power system. NREL's already said utilities will get more value co-locating solar power and energy storage. Look, when the uh, Kentucky Coal Museum 
put solar on its roof because it's cheaper than hooking to the coal-fired grid at its doorstep, you know it's over. <laughs> Boulder, we can do this. And when we do, we will make more money. This is the Fort Collins climate energy. These are the Boulder numbers. Created more than 7,500 jobs. Gross domestic product increase of 7.8 billion or 49%. Emissions down 13%. How are we going to deal with the financial collapse brought on by the stranded assets? AOC said it. A Green New Deal. Again, we have the answers, whether it be Mark Jacobson's Solutions Project or the Green New Deal or any of the strategies that have been laid out for deep, deep decarbonization. It's time to act. As William Gibson said, the future's already here. It's just not widely distributed yet. We can have a finer future. Change is coming. The young people are bringing it. Greta said adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. I don't want your hope. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. Then I want you to act. I want you to act as if the house was on fire because it is. This really is the challenge to us. Maimonides said, each one of us must see ourselves as though the entire world were held in balance, and any deed we do may tip the scales. So I'm deeply grateful to all of you for coming tonight, for caring, for being members of CREST. Let's do it.